Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Kyle Mox. I am the director of the Office of National Scholarships Advisement at Arizona State University. I'm also the Associate Dean for National Scholarships for the entirety of the university. And so today we are going to be talking about um, a broad overview of different fellowships that are available for students uh, pursuing STEM careers, right? So students that are currently uh, majoring in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics majors who wanna go on to graduate school in these fields, who wanna uh, seek careers or do research in these fields. So um, as I mentioned, this is a fairly uh, introductory session. So we're gonna kind of cover this from a high level and we're gonna, um, be talking about a few awards, but we're not intended to get into the nitty gritty here. We're trying to give everyone here a starting point. So we've got a pretty diverse audience. Um, one of the things I'm sharing with you, I just popped it into the chat and we will send this to you all uh, via email and follow up as well. But this is just a, a basic handout or an overview of uh, a lot of the awards that we're talking about today. So links to all of these programs, uh, a little more explanation and sort of, um, sort of Sort of a general organization of how, how these are grouped uh, in that PDF that you now have access to. So if you have any issues with that, let me know. I will probably post again in the chat before we're done, but might be useful to have on hand as we move into the into the discussion. So um, I recognize some names in there. Many names in the in the attendance chat box there are new to me. Uh, and so for a lot of people, this might be your first time interacting with uh, my office. So and that phrase, national scholarships, I mean, most of us know what a scholarship is. Uh, you'll hear me saying the word fellowship repeatedly uh, over the next uh, few minutes. And there's always a lot of confusion, like, okay, what is that? I know what a scholarship is, but what's a national scholarship? And how is that different from a fellowship? So um, it's difficult to generalize about hundreds of different awards, right? Uh, to say something that's true about all of them, but I will say this in general, that um, all of the awards that we're going to discuss today, and the majority, 99.9% .9 of the awards that my office deals with, uh, are external to ASU. And so that is why they're called national, meaning that uh, they are open to applicants from all over the country. Uh, because of that large application pool, they tend to be highly competitive. We're dealing with a much larger scale of pool uh, numbering in the hundreds or even thousands, as opposed to maybe a few dozen or 50 or 75, as you would have for an application for an ASU research um, uh, opportunity or something like that. Um, they are merit-based in all cases. You know, none of these awards is solely need-based, right? Um, many of these awards, particularly from the federal government, are taking into consideration different types of merit, uh, so there are a lot of programs out there for people that have been from historically excluded populations or maybe do have financial need or lack of access or privilege or things like that. But at the end of the day, that is in addition to demonstrated achievement in certain criteria. And those criteria vary from program to program. Some have very high expectations for a grade point average. Others are looking for a practical experience, some both, some neither. Um, and that's why you know, our office exists is to help you navigate that. They are all mission driven, meaning that they exist for a specific purpose, whether that is to draw people into federal service careers or to ensure that we have a steady pipeline of people that are interested in atmospheric sciences or people that want to work in conservation. Um, they're not just general funding for overall excellence. There is a very specific mission. There is a reason why they're created and why the government or nonprofit agency or whatever created this program. And that's going to be very important as you think about how do I approach this application? What do I say? What do they want to hear? Um, and because they're competitive, because they're very generous, because um, of the merit and the mission and everything combined, uh, all of these awards are very prestigious. These are all things that you would want to have on your resume. They are going to help you uh, a lot as you move forward into the next stage of life. So as you're applying to, say, graduate programs, that you know whether or not you've received a Goldwater scholarship could be the difference between whether or not you get to go to MIT or whether or not you get to go to uh, a less desirable school, at least for you. Um, I firmly believe that there's no such thing as the best school. There's the best school for you. But for some of you, you might have uh, high ambitions and winning one of these awards can really help you um, get looked at a little more seriously is another way to put it. In terms of what they provide, again, I don't want to generalize, you know, but the assumption is that if it's a scholarship or a fellowship, it's providing money, right? Um, and so the amount of funding varies wildly. The terms of use for the funding varies wildly. But in most cases, if there's funding attached to this, the intention is that funding is for educational expenses. 
Now, in some cases, that can mean tuition at, you know, as an enrolled student somewhere. In other cases, it just means it's paying for an educational experience, um, research experience, language study experience, something like that. In a, in a different way of looking at it, they provide access as well. So some of these might help you literally get into a graduate program. Uh, some of them are pathways into a graduate program. Some are going to get you access to world-class research facilities or faculty. Uh, in other cases, the, the, the access is, is a bit more abstract, meaning that uh, because you have a couple of these awards on your CV, you now have access to a, another layer of, of opportunity. You've leveled up, so to speak. And fellowship, I like that word because, uh, as opposed to scholarship, because it implies some act implies some activity or involvement or experience. And all of the, these awards do in some way uh, provide access to an experience. They're not just a check and say, great job, here you go. There's going to be a connection with alumni groups or networks. There's going to be job training, internships, uh, group cohort meetings. In other cases, travel, we're going to be working at a national lab or going abroad or things like that. And because of that, you know, the intention is that you're training for some later purpose, meaning that if you are applying for fellowship, you need to be able to explain why you are, right? What are you going to do with the benefits of this fellowship other than this, just cash the check and go on your merry way? And all of that then, like I said, levels you up, provides a certain sort of status. You can actually say to, to other people, yes, I am a Morris K. Udall, Morris K. and, and Stuart Udall scholar, or I'm an NSF graduate research fellowship recipient, right? You can put that as part of your title or put it in your email signature. So uh, ANSA, or you might see LAFANSA, which I think is a hilarious acronym, but we are the Lorraine W. Frank Office of National Scholarships Advisement. Um, we serve the entirety of ASU. We serve all um, currently enrolled and alumni. Uh, we serve all of the campuses. We serve graduate and undergraduate students online and in person. So that's a pretty big client pool, right? Um, but, you know, there are a lot of different types of students at ASU. There's a lot of different types of fellowships, and we're working very hard to make sure that we are promoting the widest possible range of awards while still being able to provide the highest quality advising. So we have to be strategic in how we target things. So we promote, you know, certain batches of awards like we're doing today. So I reached out to students at a certain academic, you know, performance level in certain fields of study um, at certain points in their undergraduate career to say, hey, now is a good time for you to come and listen to, to, to some of this information, which is why you're all here today. Um, so some of that is sort of broad passive recruiting. Some of that is targeted recruiting, like I, I did with most of you. Once we get students into the application pipeline, that be, then we start be providing uh, individualized advice or guidance through specific processes. It's not uncommon for people to apply, students to apply for multiple awards, particularly over their lifespan as a student or recent graduate. Uh, many of our most successful candidates apply for three, four, five different awards. Um, so don't think that that's unusual, it's not. Um, in some cases, students are applying for multiple awards in one cycle, and so we can help you strategize with how to manipulate and move your, your different materials from one application to the next. Many awards, particularly the most prestigious awards, have a requirement you be nominated by ASU before you can even be considered. Um, and so any process that requires nomination is managed by my office. Uh, we are um, working with faculty committees to determine, in, in some cases, we're limited to the number of people we can nominate, in other cases not, but we're trying to make sure that we're doing the right thing or being, providing the best possible outcome for everyone involved from our faculty to the university as a whole, to you as the individual student, to our office, and to the award sponsor. We want to be sure that we are sending them uh, great applications, and so if you engage with us uh, and get involved in our programming, our curriculum, our individual advising, um, we can guarantee you, if you put in the effort, that your application that goes forward is going to be the best possible application that you can write. Um, but again, part of that is on you, part of it is on us. And in that background there, if you haven't been to our offices, that's what our you know, students informally call the wall of fame. So if you're successful in one of these awards, chances are good that you'll get your picture up uh, for posterity in the wall of fame and honors hall in, as part of the Barrett complex. Um, all right. so. Before we get into um, nitty gritty, you know, just a couple of fact checks real quick. You know, first, I'm not going to disguise the fact that national scholarships and fellowships are extraordinarily competitive, ranging, you know, some are in the 40% range, uh, maybe even a little over 40%, uh, more commonly down into the 20 to teens, and so in some cases, uh, less than 3%. 
something like the Rhodes Scholarship or the Knight Hennessy Scholarship would be in the, the 3% range. Um, that we should know, right? That's something we accept as we're going in, that these are all very competitive. Um, if they were not, I would not have a job. Fact number two, uh, because they are so competitive, because they are so valuable, the process itself can be very challenging. And if you're going to go down this pathway, uh, you must prepare yourself that you're going to work very hard. These are not the sort of applications that you can throw together the night before they're due. Uh, we don't just send things off to see what happens, right? They're too competitive. Too many other people are working very hard. So your amount of effort and our amount of effort are two things in the process we can control. Among the things we cannot control are the attitudes, opinions, biases, or just general predilections of the people who are on the interview panels or the selection panels. Um, so um, we focus on what we can control and we will uh, control what we can, and that is our effort. So other fact, we're here to help, right? You know, here are some of our peer mentors that are here to help, aunts is here to help, your faculty are here to help, your deans, directors, program directors, all of these people are here to help. There is a huge network of support all throughout ASU for our students. Um, and I think that's easy to forget as you're working alone in your residence hall room or you know, in your parents' dining room or at Starbucks or wherever, as you're working on um, these applications, it's really easy to get lost and, and to think, okay, I'm the only one going through this. The fact of the matter is um, there are dozens if not hundreds of other people around in your department, in your college that have gone through similar processes, um, faculty members that apply for these sorts of things all the time, people in my office that can help guide you through things. So don't be afraid to ask for help. That's why we're here. That's why the university exists. And, you know, fact number four, we do win, right? You know, we, we, win, we win pretty pretty commonly, actually. And you can see over the past 10 years, we've done extraordinarily well in terms of what I would call the top tier fellowships, two Rhodes scholarships, three Marshall scholarships, 10 Gate Cambridge scholarships in 10 years. That, that's better than most of the Ivy League schools. Um, second best in the nation for Udall scholars uh, in the top uh, quartile for Goldwater scholars, 22. Um, and we're about 11 years in a row, we've been a top Fulbright producing school, right? So um, that result is not the outcome of luck. That, that result is the outcome of individual student effort coupled with uh, really great advising structure and resources faculty commitment and peer involvement, right? Our students tend to help each other with these awards as well. So it's a collaborative effort um, and that's born really great results and a ton of life-changing experiences for a lot of candidates. Um, I just posted in the chat, uh, for those of you that came in after I did it the first time, a link to a handout that's going along with this. It's an overview of the fellowships we're gonna talk about today. Um, and I mentioned at the outset, uh, if you wanna be able to refer to this stuff later, yeah, we're gonna follow up via email with a recording of this and, um, and you can access that via our YouTube channel once it's done processing. So um, this is our website. If you haven't been here, you probably have been if you registered for this. Um, but we do intend this website to be a resource for you as you're beginning the process, as you're navigating through and trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to apply for? How am I going to apply for it? When does everything do? So uh, there is a scholarship database on our website. So under scholarships, you can find that. For any of the awards that have a campus deadline or process, that process is detailed under apply now. That's a small number, but you know those are, like I said, those are some of the more marquee programs. And if you have any questions about, okay, I see that the Goldwater requires a nomination, what's that process like? You don't have to email me, you can just check, out, check it out right there. Um, if you're not subscribed to the weekly email bulletin, um, what you should do uh, is uh, subscribe to it, and that way you'll be up to, up to speed on every different event that's coming down the pike, um, all of our workshops, programming, in, further info sessions, deadlines, uh, and even some awards that we don't include in the database that are kind of new or just kind of niche or things like that, uh, news about our winners, and other things uh, of interest. Um, and lastly, uh, if, once you're ready to get in, and, and we'll talk more about what your timeline should be and what your process should be in a, in a moment, um, but you can make an appointment right through our website. We have an online booking platform. You just pick, you know, which topic you want to you want advising about. It'll connect you with the right advisor schedule, and off you go. So pretty easy, right? We're working with a large number of students, and we try to make everything as easy uh, and accessible as possible. So, uh, getting started. How do we get started? Where do we go? 
first, and this is one of the first questions any of us are, are going to ask you when you come in is, why are you applying for this? Or why do you wanna apply for this? Or what's the bigger picture? What's your career goal? I'll usually ask you, what do you wanna be when you grow up, which gives everyone fits. Um, but we need to know uh, what, um, what do we wanna apply for things for? Am I trying to support continued study? Am I just trying to pay for my undergraduate tuition? Do I want access to research opportunities? Do I want professional development? Um, do I want to go abroad? Or do I just want to spend a year doing something cool before I go on to graduate school? Do I want to get involved in service? So on and so forth. There's a lot of different reasons why people apply for fellowships. So um, as you're doing that, then you should also take a look with a very wide lens of what's even out there, what's available. And so like I said, our scholarship database has approaching 100 different opportunities on there. That is certainly not a finite list of scholarships and fellowships, but we've curated that to be, excuse me, manageable. Um, it's something, and those are awards that we think are good fits for ASU student or that ASU students have won in the past. And if an ASU student wins a new award, boom, goes on the database, right? So now we're experts on it. Um, but, you know, be wide in the beginning. And then as you start to narrow down to think, okay, that's everything that's possible. Now, what aligns with my goals? what aligns with my background and start narrowing down to things that you think might be good fits for you. And that at that point, when you start engaging with us and say, okay, I know I want to go for a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, I'm looking at these three or four different awards. You know, what do you think? How do I get started? And chances are good that you'll come out of that conversation with a few more ideas. Uh, and that once we know what your objectives are, once we know kind of types of things you're looking for, then we can make better recommendations. And one of our outcomes we hope in our first advising meetings are to create a timeline for you because in a perfect world, you are looking at awards that you aren't going to be applying for until a year or two down the road. And we, that gives us time then to talk about, okay, here's what you can do to improve your competitiveness for those awards. So um, I've, I've broken out you know, many of the fellowships uh, into uh, categories, right? You know, kind of groupings of different types of fellowships. So, um, and just, you know, FYI, all the student, all the pictures of the people you see here, except for the stock photo I stole for the beginning couple slides, um, these are real ASU students who have won some of these different awards, right? Uh, we have a, a really great alumni network, um, and we are happy to uh, connect you with people that have been through the process before. So, um, I do see a couple of questions coming in the chat. So, uh, I forgot to mention at the outset, let's, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. I'll kind of glance and see if it's something um, emergent that we need to address right now, but otherwise happy to engage in a little conversation once I'm kind of through the main material. Um, the first group I'm talking about are, are fellowships offered by different federal agencies. Um, wading into the federal bureaucracy can be pretty intimidating, right? And, and so there are a couple of great resources for narrowing that down, but almost all of the major federal agencies have some sort of undergraduate um, scholarship to bring students into that particular area of need. So the Department of Defense is looking for STEM researchers that want to be developing or working on projects that are relevant to US national security interests, which are almost all of them. Uh, the cool thing about SMART, it is also provides guaranteed employment for you once you're done with your education. Department of Energy um, has uh, fellowships available for people that are interested in fields related to energy policies. Now you'll notice that I'm not mentioning any specific majors as we move through. Um, it's very rare that there's sort of a one-to-one -one alignment between a fellowship or scholarship and majors. So that's a question we get up front a lot. I'm a bio major, what can I apply for? I'm like, well, do you wanna be a wildlife conservation biologist or do you want to be a physician or do you wanna be a teacher? I mean, there's a lot of different things we can do with different majors. So we're really focused more on the objectives. Uh, Department of State um, has a uh, uh, information technology. This is a brand new and an information technology fellowship. And this is for people that would like to work with Department of State in the foreign service and working um, with uh, cybersecurity and awareness. NASA has what's called, I like Aussie, one-stop shop initiative, right? And so they've got a lot of different types of fellowships for younger uh, college students and high school students to graduating students and graduate students. And they've got all of those in one place. You can kind of search through there for different, um, different opportunities. The National Institutes of Health has the undergraduate uh, scholars program. And these are research opportunities with the National Institutes of Health. So if you're going into more of a public health or healthcare provision field, that might be a great fit. And if you're interested in meteorology or atmospheric sciences or planetary science, uh, NOAA has a really wonderful two-year fellowship called the Hollings uh, that's going to connect you up with a mentor that's going to get you involved in, in research experiences. 
Uh, I would also recommend that you look at the national laboratories. And I didn't pull out, I didn't go through all different 17 national labs and pull out what all their different undergraduate research opportunities are. Um, you know, you can you can track that down yourself by just going to their websites. I included a, a, a master link on, on the on the handout. Uh, but like Argonne, uh, I used to work up in Chicago. You know, Fermilab has a has a, a, a great undergraduate program in their accelerator laboratory. Um, Oak Ridge, of course, has a really great undergraduate research program. Uh, Los Alamos, Sandia, Lawrence Livermore. I've had students who become really wonderful applicants for a lot of other fellowships go through the national labs. Um, these technically aren't fellowships. I mean, they're going to provide full funding for you to be able to live while you're traveling to go to one of these national labs. Uh, you're going to get a mentor, you're going to work. But uh, what I would say is like, these are really wonderful qualifying experiences for a lot of other fellowships. So people that apply for things like the Goldwater Scholarship or the NSF um, get a lot more serious attention if they've already been placed at a national lab, which is more difficult than say being placed in a lab in your department back at ASU. Not that you shouldn't engage with research at ASU, but placement in some of these national opportunities can be impressive uh, depending on the circumstance. We also have a menu of options for what we call summer STEM. Um, some of these are federal programs still, but you know what these all have in common is that they are summer opportunities. Uh, we recognized a few years ago that you know people in area studies and languages and, and humanities and all these other um, non-STEM fields have a lot of great opportunities in the summer to travel or study abroad or things like that. And so we decided, okay, let's package this up a bit more. Um, so the Amgen Scholars Program is actually from, you know, a, a non-governmental organization, an industry organization, and they have research placements, kind of like REUs um, in, in 24 partner institutions in the U.S. related to sort of biotech research, or even Japan. Uh, they do have uh, Asia placements. Dodd Rise is the German Academic Exchange Service, so that's the German government's foreign exchange program, research internships in science and engineering. So you could spend the summer um, engaged in a research opportunity uh, at a lab uh, somewhere in Germany. So to, this week has been fun because we've been getting all of our match placements for our applicants this year. Uh, so far right now, we're up to eight students who have been um, matched with, with a lab in Germany. We'll be going to Germany this summer to engage in research. Uh, if your interest is more in the conservation realm of things, the Doris Duke Conservation Scholars Program is open to first and second year students, which makes it pretty cool. There aren't a lot of awards open to first, uh, first year students, uh, but this is a two year program where you would be, in, again, matched with a host and engage in conservation related research. Some of the opportunities are very hardcore STEM. Some are maybe a little bit more in the sustainability social science realm, uh, but our students that have gone on these programs have had fantastic experiences. Uh, perhaps the best known, and again, I wouldn't technically call this a fellowship, but uh, the NSF research experiences for undergraduate. Uh, many of you might be familiar with this, many of you might have already done it, but every um, pr principal investigator, every PI that gets NSF funding, um, in most cases, they also have to earmark some of that funding to provide research experiences for undergraduates. And these opportunities are open to students from all over the country, which means that you can search through the listing, find a project that's very closely aligned with your interests and your future plans and apply to be a part of it. Um, so groups have to have at least 10 students in it and you work under a doctoral student and you know, the principal investigator to collaborate on a research project over the summer. You get to present your results. So it has all of those great benefits I talked about. Uh, you get to uh, apply and compete for something at the national level. Uh, you get some different guidance from somebody outside of the ASU sphere. You get a publication or presentation out of it. You get a letter of recommendation out of it. Um, the REUs are really wonderful. And then the SURF program, Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship from the National Instrument and something. It's got four or five different technical areas, but it's really in, in, interested in um, uh, scientific measurement and technology and things like that. So it's a relatively new agency. Then we start to move up a little bit into what I would call the marquee fellowships or sort of the big prestigious undergraduate fellowships. Uh, the Goldwater Scholarship is perhaps, um, I wouldn't even say perhaps, it is the top award uh, in the United States for uh, students in STEM fields who aspire to research careers. We can only nominate four students to it per year. Every university can only nominate two students, which I think is a great equalizer, right? But it makes our choice especially difficult because we, we are a large university with a lot of wonderful undergraduate research opportunities. Um, it's very difficult 
to get nominated at ASU. And oddly enough, once you get nominated, you've got about a 50-50% chance of winning the award because our, our applicant pools are that strong. Uh, so you're in good hands. Is what, I'm not trying to scare you off. You're in good hands. Um, if your research is, in a, again, more of an environmental or conservation um, uh, orientation, consider the Udall Scholarship. Uh, people look at that one and they see kind of its broad focus that it's kind of broadly focused on environmentalism. But um, most of our winners from the past few years in the environmental category have been STEM majors. One year we had two chemical engineers. We had two Udall scholars, both engineers uh, win it. So um, if, if you're very focused on uh, environmental applications, Udall could be for you. And then the Boren Scholarship actually has a special provision uh, for STEM majors. So the Boren Scholarship is a DOD program. And what it's trying to do is provide opportunities for immersive critical language study abroad. That is to say, anything besides English, Spanish, German, or French, anywhere in the world that is relevant to US national security interests. For STEM majors, they allow you to go as short as eight weeks. Uh, typically, they want to see people going for 25, 26 weeks, which isn't feasible if you've got a physics sequence you've got to finish for, for your degree, right? Um, so if you're a STEM major and you want to do some language acquisition, you can do that through Boren. And even if you find you have a, an international uh, research placement or something like that, let's say you get a research internship at a foreign university, you can apply for Boren funding if you can also prove that you'll be doing language study during that time. So once we start getting up into third and fourth year and even uh, one or two years out of graduation, we start looking at the postgraduate fellowships. So that would mean opportunities after you graduate with your bachelor's degree. Um, the top of, you know, one of the ones at the top of this list is the Churchill Scholarship. Again, this is one of the ones we have to nominate for it. And in fact, even beyond that, you have to be an invited school. So we're one of the, the few invited schools that participates in the Churchill Scholarship. We can only nominate two students per year. And um, it provides complete and full funding for a one-year master's program at Cambridge University. Uh, you'll be in Churchill College with the other Churchill Scholars. Uh, fantastic experience. So we haven't actually been in the program that long. Um, Chris Balzer there in 2016 was our first. Uh, we had been in since 2014. Uh, and Chris is now uh, back. He's at Caltech rounding out the fourth year of his, his PhD. Uh, the Hertz Foundation Fellowship and the NSF GRFP. Both of these awards are kind of broad funding schemes for uh, doctoral study or advanced graduate study in STEM fields. Hertz is a, is a smaller foundation and it is that Hertz, like the Hertz rental car, he donated his net worth uh, to this foundation to promote scientific study. Um, the NSF, the National Science Foundation is a much larger program, it gives out about 2000 awards per year, essentially gives out $50,000 in funding excuse me, $35,000 in funding per year, plus a living stipend, very generous. It's about 90,000 in total funding. Um, what I like most about NSF, and if any of you are in an NSF supported field and you're thinking about doing a PhD, you will apply for this as a graduating senior. I didn't say should, right? You will apply for this as a graduating senior because you can apply for it again as a first or second year graduate student. So you can't go back and get that shot over again. You get a free shot basically as a graduating senior to go for it. And just think how wonderful it is if you were going into deciding on your PhD programs, knowing that you're completely fully funded, right? I'm bringing my own funding. So this is a big program. It's one that we'd like to see more students apply for. Um, we'll be starting uh, more intentional advising about this later into the spring. It's due in early fall, and we're actually hiring uh, an entirely new staff member just to focus on uh, NSF and a few other awards. Uh, the OxCamp program is an NIH program that basically you do your rotations for doctoral study between uh, the National Institutes of Health in Maryland and a mentor at either Oxford or Cambridge. And you can finish a PhD in four years through this program. You don't have to do any coursework, you just do research, pretty cool. We've had ASU students do this program before. Uh, the other cool thing about it is you can actually do this as part of an MD PhD. Uh, and so if you're in a more uh, bio area in your research, that might be one of interest to you. And of course, there's many other postgraduate fellowships that are open field, meaning that you don't have to be any particular major to compete for them. They consider all majors and fields of study. So we have had many other STEM majors, many STEM majors apply and compete for these graduate fellowships as well. Uh, Ford Foundation Fellowship funds any research PhD, any research focused PhD. Um, their primary, it's a National Academies program and they're really looking to um, be more inclusive and equitable and increase the diversity of the American professoriate. And that can mean a lot of different things. 
Uh, it's a very generous award, top shelf. Fulbright, I'm sure many of you have heard of Fulbright. Um, if you go walk past the Wall of Fame and Honors Hall, that whole first floor is pretty much all Fulbright, huge program for ASU. What a lot of people wouldn't consider, and I hear this all the time, um, you know, this program, it provides full funding for like nine or 10 months in an academic year um, in a foreign country. And a lot of people say, oh yeah, that only goes to, you know, language people, or that only goes to people teaching English, right? No, absolutely not. You know, we have oodles of STEM people doing independent research projects or doing graduate study uh, in a foreign country with Fulbright funding. You know, I've had people doing uh, pandemic research. I've had people doing research on stingless bees in Panama. Um, I've had people doing research in a synthetic meat lab in, in um, Amsterdam, uh, people doing research on different fish, fish species uh, in the Yangtze River. I mean, anything, as long as it involves engagement with another culture or country, it's a Fulbright project. Gates Cambridge, full funding for any graduate degree at Cambridge University. Knight Hennessy, full funding for any postgraduate program at Stanford University. Um, that includes professional degrees. Marshall Scholarship for uh, graduate study at any university in the UK. Rhodes Scholarship for any graduate program at Oxford. And then the Sam Vid Scholars Program is brand new, um, just running its second cycle this year. I wasn't even aware of it last year. I guess it was a soft open. Um, they just opened up their application and this would be appropriate right now for anyone who has already applied to and been accepted to graduate school because it's due in March. And one of the requirements is that you be starting your graduate or professional school in the fall. Uh, but it's essentially, I think three years of funding at $50,000 a year, two years of funding at $50,000 a year. And then the Soros Fellowship for New Americans. And this would mean anyone who was born abroad and is, in a, naturalized, is a naturalized citizen or any natural born citizen whose parents were born abroad. And that's, um, I wanna say $90,000 in funding for graduate or professional school. So again, I provided links in the handout so you can go in and take a deeper look at all of this criteria. You can use our scholarship database um, to, to, to narrow the search a bit more. And the most common question I get at this stage of the game as people are learning to engage or once they've made their list or once they've identified the awards is, okay, I'm applying for that in two years. What can I be doing now to make myself a more competitive applicant? Um, again, difficult to generalize because that success looks like a lot of different things for all these different fellowships, but the best blanket advice I can give you is that make sure that you're pursuing a challenging curriculum. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're loading yourself up with 21 credit hours. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're you know, trying to abuse yourself by taking the hardest classes you can. But you know, if given the option, you are taking the most challenging courses available in your major, you're being thoughtful about the curriculum, meaning that if I'm aspiring to this particular PhD, I need to have theoretical chemistry, I need to have pretty advanced uh, mathematics background and quantitative skills, I'd also wanna be sure I got some programming. So look at the big picture, right? Uh, nobody's impressed with a 4.0 who took the easy way out, you know, and, and graduate programs aren't always impressed by 4.0s, they're gonna look at that transcript. That could also mean, um, opportunities to go deeper, right? And so if you're not a Barrett student, um, consider an upper division transfer. So we, you know, Barrett accepts people, um, Barrett accepts people in uh, for the last two years, you can apply either as an incoming student or um, as a student entering into third year, the acceptance rate is very high for upper division transfers. And that would be an opportunity for you to engage with some hands-on faculty to get some honors credit on your transcript. And then also, uh, have to produce an honors thesis, which if you think about preparation for graduate study or any of these fellowships is a huge benefit. Um, seeking out ASU research opportunities. Yeah, if anyone comes to me about Goldwater or NSF or anything like that, and they give me their CV and they've got no research on there, I'm like, that's the first thing we got to do. We got to get you in a lab. So if you're in Fulton, you know, looking through Fury or Epics, if you're in, um, you know, the School of uh, Earth and Space Exploration. There's a ton of NASA space grants available for different projects. Um, there are faculty members out there offering you research opportunities. And if you're completely uh, in the dark about how to get after that, that's one thing we'd be happy to talk to you about. Um, and it's also important that all of these, to, to note that all of these fellowships require letters of recommendation. Um, in fact, I can't think of any of them that require fewer than two. Some of them require several. Um, and so you need to start building those relationships with your faculty members. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, buying them Girl Scout cookies and Starbucks cards, although that certainly helps. Um, but what that does mean is asking good questions, um, being curious about their research, being curious about what's being taught in class, 
uh, finding that opportunity to invite them into your development because that's why they have this job. They wanna help students become better. Um, and then getting involved with research, getting involved with their volunteer and community programs, and then just kind of working in your departments to, to build those relationships. Uh, many of your departments and majors have professional organizations, and those are great opportunities to get involved with all those other things, to find uh, better class choices, to find research opportunities, to connect with other people that are trying to do the same thing you are, and to get involved in service and leadership as well. And don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, a lot of people, um, I think, are afraid of looking stupid. Um, perhaps not enough people, but you know, a lot of people are, are afraid of looking stupid, so they don't want to ask like so asking your academic advisor, how do I even get involved in research anyway? That's fine, right? You gotta ask those questions. Um, it's a big confusing place. It's a big confusing world. Um, every, every professor's favorite student is the one that asks a lot of questions, right? And do plan ahead, right? The, the, the frustra most frustrating thing every year is we, we get contacted by an applicant who's like, oh yeah, I wanna apply for nomination to this award. And we're like, oh, the campus deadline was two weeks ago. They're like, oh, I was on the website and I didn't know there was a campus deadline. Like, well. You know, if we had planned a year or two ahead of time, you would have known that. Um, I'm sorry. You know, hopefully you're still eligible next year. You can apply next year, and and that way you're you're not missing these things. So subscribing to that bulletin, going to our info sessions, and kind of laying out that timeline that I mentioned earlier can help avoid that heartache. So where do we go from here? Um, do some more of that research, right? I, I gave you. Um, and for anyone else that didn't get it, I'll put it in there again. I gave you that handout as a starting point. We've got the scholarships database. Start reflecting on what the bigger point is. Like, I really love my major. I know I wanna do this sort of thing the rest of my life. Um, how do I do that? You know, Do I wanna go to graduate school? Do I wanna go abroad? And really think through that stuff. Start making those lists that I was talking about. You know, Our advising meetings go so much better if a student comes in like, okay, I've got a list of eight awards that I'm thinking of. And even if only one of them you know, is, is reasonable, that's fine, right? That gives us a starting point. Uh, pay attention to those criteria, the timelines, if you're even eligible. Um, you know, obviously most of the federal programs uh, require US citizenship because they're taxpayer funded. So, you know, keep that in mind as you're looking. Like, do Can I actually apply for this? No, they're not negotiable on those criteria. And then once you're ready, you've got questions built up, you're ready to get started, you can go to our website and schedule an appointment. So if you're a first or second year student and you're just kind of getting started, you're not really sure what fellowships are you're ready to go for, you know they're a couple of years off, um, our best starting point for you is to just do a general onset advising session with Shay Masterson, who I think is, is here today. Um, she, I know she was a second ago. Um, and then for upper division students, as you're getting serious, like, okay, yeah, I know I wanna apply for Goldwater. It's like, I know I wanna apply for uh, NSF, you know, you can schedule with me and I've got a lot of different, um, I got a lot of different topics you can choose from once you get to our online platform. So, so again, all of those resources you can access, uh, you know, through our website, um, onsa.asu.edu. That's where you can get on the bulletin. That's where you can get to the database. That's where you can get to the application instructions for nominated awards. That's where you can schedule appointments. So, all right, time check. Good. We got plenty of time for Q&A. Um, one just popped in and I'll back up and get that one that was asked earlier. So Yumi asked, what if we transfer to ASU as a junior? The way that I'm going to answer that question is to help clarify, you know, what the different fellowships mean when they say freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. What they're really thinking about is time left until graduation. So people come in all the time and they say, well, I've got this dual credit and AP credit. And I went to community college for a while and I've actually got 4,000 credits, but I've to finish my major, I've got two years left. If you've got two years left before you get your bachelor's degree, you're presently a junior and you're a rising, excuse me, you're presently a sophomore or rising junior. That's what they care about. Um, and in answer to your specific question, Yumi, it's really gonna depend on what your needs are. If like, you know, like, hey, I wanna apply for Fulbright, then yeah, make an appointment with me. If you don't really know where we're going, then uh, Shea would be the best place to go. Um, question asked earlier from uh, Leah, uh, once we've narrowed down some awards and what we wanna do, is that when it's best to schedule our first meeting? Absolutely, like I said, um, the, the waste of a 30 minutes with us is to log on or sit down or get on the phone with us. And we do Zoom in-person and phone appointments um, and say, okay, so can I have more information about fellowships, right? You know. More than what? I don't know where we're starting from. So once we've got a starting point to say, I'm thinking about graduate school, I'm looking at these several different awards, that makes that 30 minute appointment so much more valuable. So good question. Um, Julian asks, what types of fellowships are recommended for upper division undergraduates that are aspiring to get into medical school? 
Um, it's a good question, right? Um, medical school, a lot of people ask about that. Um, you'll notice that none of the awards I talk about today, with a couple of exceptions, are really intended for, grad, for medical school. Reason being, uh, the practice of medicine in the United States is a highly profitable career, and we do not need to entice large numbers of academically talented people to medical school. In fact, the process of getting into medical school is quite difficult. Um, and then the expectation is that if a person cannot afford to pay for medical school, then they'll probably just borrow the money and then afford to pay it off because again, being a physician is highly lucrative. So that gives you some insight as to why certain fellowships exist, right? The NOAA says, I wanna attract a talented scientist to this career because not a lot of people wake up and say, you know, I'd really like to be a climate scientist, right? Um, some people do. So, but, you know, as, as, as he answered his own question, or would it come down to objectives, like we stated? Absolutely. If you come in and say, I'm looking for money for, for medical school, I would say, I don't, I don't really don't have much. There's a couple that would, but, um, but it really does come down to objectives. So we see a lot of pre-meds, for instance, who do want to get involved in research, uh, getting involved in certain research uh, programs at different federal agencies, and that's going to buff their entire application for medical school, or maybe they want to go on to an MD, PhD, or something like that. Or people want to just be a better physician in the long run, long run and then apply for Fulbright and spend a year teaching English abroad um, and drawing on their science background to teach science units to their English language learners or something like that. So it really does come down to, you know, what is it you're trying to accomplish with a fellowship application? So tough question. Um, ask what type of scholarship is suitable? Okay, I'm not going to answer any questions about what scholarship goes to specific majors. Um, that's just kind of not how this works, right? And, and like I said, there's never a one to one correlation between a fellowship and majors for the most case. It has to do with career objective. And so I encourage you all to do that research to say, okay, I see that the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship is looking for NSF supported fields, which does include computer science. Uh, any other questions? If this is your first time engaging with us, I know it's like getting a drink from a fire hose. Um, and there's a lot of information out there. So like I said, we're going to break it down uh, into steps, right? And so we're kind of at the wide end of a funnel right now. And we timed this information session at this time of the year because there are no immediate deadlines. There's nothing that any that we talked about today that you would need to apply for in the next two or three months. Um, and so what we'd like to do is get you started on the planning process. And for those of you that are rising seniors, current juniors looking ahead, now's a good time to say, okay, what do I need to be working on this summer? So um, uh, a question came up in direct message to me, and this is a good question, right? Um, what op opportunities are available to international students? Again, that's part of the research process, looking at the eligibility criteria for these. But as I said, if it's coming from the US federal government, it's not going to fund a non-US citizen uh, because it's taxpayer funded. Uh, Brittany asked a good, really great question. Do you recommend on-campus research? Absolutely. And is it easier opposed to getting a scholarship through these programs and fellowships opportunities? Yes, um, usually. <laughs> it's, it's usually easier, or I, I'll say not necessarily easier, but statistically more likely to get an on-campus uh, research placement. Uh, reason being is it's just scale, right? You know, if you think about how many people are applying for Goldwater, you know, there's a thousand, 1,300 or so, all of which were nominated by their university, as opposed to say maybe 12 people applying for this research position uh, in this lab in your department. Um, and also it's right here, it's a little more personal. And so I do really recommend, I don't think I, I would really ever see uh, an NSF applicant or a top shelf Fulbright applicant or somebody who is applying uh, for awards that hasn't done some on-campus research. So younger students, yeah, you gotta walk before you can run and getting involved in undergraduate research on campus is a wonderful stepping stone to some of these bigger national opportunities. So very good question. So the simple answer is both, right? Um, both. Um, you know, extramural and on-campus research opportunities. Um, I didn't see the first half of Hussein's question was asking, especially with regards to freshmen. Um, okay, would you be able to restate the next steps, please? Um, yeah, so use this presentation and the handout that I provided to narrow down opportunities that interest you. Um, use our database to look for additional awards that might interest you take note of eligibility, take note of dead, uh, timelines. 
And then once you're ready to start discussing on what your specific timeline would look like or your specific preparation for these awards would be, book an appointment with one of the uh, advisors in ANSA and we can start to figure that out to say, okay, that one's three years away. Here's what you need to do between now and then. Or this one is next year. This is what we need to do. Absolutely. And we love getting younger students in, right? It's so much easier to help plan two or three years than it is to say, okay, uh, this is due in a month. <laughs> um, I guess we'll get to know each other, right? Would we use the link on the screen to book an appointment? There is a link on the ANSA website that says book an appointment. So you can use that. Good. As I said, uh, this has been recorded. So uh, it'll be available for you as soon as it's processed. Um, I'll send a follow-up email to you all um, and you can access it for later reference. You have that handout. Um, and I'll post the link once again in case you missed it earlier in the chat. And like I said, if you have any questions that occur to you after the fact, don't hesitate to email them to either myself or Shay uh, or just the ANSA general email, ansa at asu.edu. Otherwise, I really do hope we'll see you sometime the rest of the school year, over the summer, or even into the fall. So you all have a great weekend. Thanks for making the time. I really appreciate it.